Hey and welcome to today's session for Devtoberfest 2022 What even is cloud native and the basics of Kubernetes? My name is Kevin Musik. I'm a developer advocate for SAP and let's get started. So the term cloud native describes the approach of building, architecting and running modern software applications in the cloud. This approach exploits the traits of the cloud which are defined as flexibility, scalability and resilience. Really important, remember those three. So if you look at how most cloud native applications are defined and especially how the Cloud Native Computing Foundation defines cloud native, the cloud native way is to containerize your applications on one hand and run them on a container orchestration runtime like Kubernetes on the other. So cloud native technologies empower organizations and individuals like yourself to build and run applications in the modern, dynamic and highly available environments like public, private and hybrid cloud solutions. So utilizing containers, service meshes, microservices, uh, immutable infrastructure and declarative APIs bring application development and its availability, like the availability of these applications to the next level. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, in short the CNCF, is a part of the Linux Foundation and it has hundreds of members from big corporations all the way uh, to smaller startups. So SAP is one of the major members of the CNCF amongst others and uh, all these members are helping to define and deliver the present as well as the future of cloud native computing. The CNCF seeks to drive adoption of the cloud native idea by providing and sustaining an ecosystem of openness and vendor neutral projects to make these amazing innovations like Kubernetes accessible to everyone. So the open source thought behind all of that is really important. Um, but, but what are the benefits of cloud native computing? And if we compare cloud native applications to the more traditional application development like um, monolithic apps, it is proven that uh, the, these cloud native applications, um, it is really easier to incrementally and automatically add new application features to them without having to shut down uh, your application or risk disruption in its availability. And that's really important. Cloud native infrastructures are more resilient and have higher availability compared to traditional on-premise uh, solutions because of modern orchestration tools and the usage of the underlying technologies um, these infrastructures actually provide. So with the help of containerization, we can achieve scalability of such apps easier and continuous integration, continuous delivery becomes almost a hassle-free task due to the automatic approaches provided by the infrastructure services themselves. Due to the approach of the cloud native way, adoption of innovation is more trouble-free and helps fulfill the demand for today's business requirements. And I've been talking about containerization quite a lot and we want to um, look into what containerization is from a high level perspective. Because when we talk about containerization, we mean the process of packaging code together with all required components like needed libraries, frameworks and other dependencies in a, into an isolated container. And uh, Josh Bentley will introduce you to containerization in week uh, three of the uh, Devtoberfest, sorry. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. But now about Kubernetes. So what is actually Kubernetes? And Kubernetes has an interesting story behind it. Um, if we look at one of the major technologies for modern cloud native application management and orchestration, it is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is uh, originating from the Greek language meaning helmsman or pilot. And it was created by Google in order to run production workloads at a wide scale. So it originates out of the Google's uh, Borg system and evolved into what it is uh, today through the amazing contributions of the community and the help of uh, the CNCF. So Kubernetes is hosted by the CNCF and it is an open source project with a huge community with over 33,000 forks, 91,000 stars and currently 800 open pull requests on GitHub. So check that out, it's pretty cool. And the definition of Kubernetes is that Kubernetes is there for managing containerized applications across multiple hosts. So it provides basic mechanisms for deployment, 
maintenance, uh, scaling of applications, and helps you run them resiliently. So Kubernetes is a powerful container orchestration tool, which follows the standards of the modern cloud native world. Um, and I've been talking about container orchestration now, but what, what actually means container orchestration? So container orchestration helps you to group systems together in the form of clusters where containers can be deployed and managed in an automated way at a high scale, uh, meeting def uh, defined requirements. And these requirements are um, fault tolerance, on-demand scalability, optimal resource usage, let me think, uh, auto discovery for automatic uh, discovery of applications and communication between containers, accessibility from the outside world to these containers over APIs, uh, seamless updates as well as rollbacks without the risk of having any downtime, uh, downtime on your application container image and more. <laughs> so if we look at these requirements, it becomes clear why you should use uh, container orchestrators. It just makes it easier for you to manage a vast number of containers running in a global infrastructure. So you don't have to manage all these containers yourself and manually. Uh, the, the Kubernetes and other container orchestrators help you with that. So some features of Kubernetes um, are basically um, like, yeah, self-healing capabilities, of course, um, for the containers. And uh, self-healing capabilities means that Kubernetes has a self-healing capability which automatically replaces and reschedules containers um, from failed nodes within your cluster. It automatically checks the health of your container images, uh, which by the way can be freely defined as well, so it gives you all the freedom um, you want. And Kubernetes uh, kills and restarts those who are run unresponsive to the defined health checks. And what is also great is that Kubernetes makes sure that incoming traffic is not routed towards unresponsive containers. The next one would be a horizontal scaling. And now I've told you that the incoming traffic is not being routed towards unresponsive containers and that a container orchestrator needs to be scalable if traffic demands it. So Kubernetes is using horizontal scaling uh, to, uh, for this, which means that applications running within uh, your Kubernetes cluster are scaled automatically or manually if needed. So based on CPU or custom metric utilization, this scaling um, can be automated. So Kubernetes detects if there is the need to up the underlying power for your application containers and schedules additional uh, nodes within your cluster to handle the higher demand. An example can be summer sales or Black Friday events where significant higher demand towards your application occurs. So let us look at an example. Kubernetes deployments manage so-called replica sets, which implement the replication and self-healing aspects I've mentioned. So with the help of a replica set, we can scale the number of pods running a specific application container image manually or using an autoscaler. If we define that we want three replicas of our container image, the replica set will make sure that three instances of this container image will be scheduled and started and maintained. So if we assume that one of these container images face an issue like being unresponsive, the pod running the image will be terminated by Kubernetes and other instances will be started up to match our defined three replications. So we can also define that Kubernetes scales up the number of replicas depending on the incoming traffic towards your cluster, which gets handled by the autoscaler. So to better understand this, uh, I will link resources for you to read into that uh, in the description of this session. The next feature would be automatic resource bin packing. So if we look at the previous point of horizontal scaling, we get to the point of automatic resource bin packing, which describes the behavior of Kubernetes to automatically uh, schedule containers based on resource needs and the given constraints to maximize potential without sacrificing the availability of your application. So most Kubernetes-based runtimes give you the possibility to define resource limits to which Kubernetes will do the automatic resource bin packing 
and scaling of your applications. And I've talked about the service discovery and the load balancing capabilities. Um, so the load balancing is um, a bit where Kubernetes redirects incoming traffic uh, to available resources. But to do this, Kubernetes is assigning individual IP addresses to containers and groups them logically to a single DNS name in order to more efficiently uh, handle load balancing requests across the, these clustered containers. And that's uh, a quite interesting and complicated topic again and resources will be linked in the description. Um, the next one would be automated rollouts and rollbacks and that's a really important one. Um, because these functions by using revisions of your deployed application containers. So each of these application containers have a revision. And Kubernetes can take changes which alter the re revision number of your application, like updates to the container image, container port, and volume mounts, and volume is storage in the Kubernetes world, to schedule new pods containing that revision. So Kubernetes will now start gradually redirect traffic to these new instances of your applications while automatically shutting down old revisions. So if issues would occur on the newer revisions, Kubernetes can automatically roll back to the older revision as these get saved within the Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, to make the list a little bit shorter, I am not going into much detail of the other features, but they're basically secret and configuration management for authentication authorization and uh, role management, so really important for orchestrators and uh, admins. And then of course, uh, storage uh, orchestration. Next, we will talk about the Kubernetes architecture. So we really have talked about a lot about what Kubernetes is and what it can do and what the features are, but you have might notice that I've managed terms you're not familiar with yet. So to help you better understand how the architecture of Kubernetes works, I will give you an overview of the single components within a Kubernetes cluster. So when working with Kubernetes, you get a clean cluster consisting of a set of worker machines. And these worker machines are called nodes. And every Kubernetes cluster comes with at least one node. These nodes function as runtime containerized applications and as runtime for containerized applications and host uh, so-called pods, which are part of the application workload. A pod represents a single instance of a running process within your cluster and contain your containerized applications. All of these components are managed by the control plane, which is part of every productive and fully functioning Kubernetes cluster. And the control plane and all its components the container runtime, the single node agents, and proxies are part of the master node. And the master node is providing a running environment for the control plane to manage the state of your Kubernetes cluster. And let's talk about the control plane components. The control plane is a central component responsible for managing components within a Kubernetes cluster. So the control plane must run at all cost. Like with us humans, the organism cannot function without its brain functioning. So components which are part of the control plane make global decisions about the cluster. They are also responsible for detecting, responding, and responding to uh, cluster events like starting up new pods. So the control plane holds only containers which are part of the cluster itself and are not deployed uh, through user interaction. So they're cluster components. It is a necessary uh, cluster component, and I want to talk into the uh, go into detail of these uh, cluster components, control plane components. Uh, one is the Kube API server. So the Kubernetes API server is the central instance of exposing the Kubernetes API over the Kube API server. A user and other components can interact with the internals of a Kubernetes cluster, and it can be scaled if needed horizontally by deploying more instances of it. Then next we have the kube scheduler. And the kube scheduler uh, has a task and the task is to watch for newly created pods which have no responsible node assigned yet. So you remember a pod is assigned to a node. The kube scheduler uh, makes sure that such pods get assigned to a node so they can get started up 
and run your application container images. There are different types of factors which are taken into account uh, for assignment. Then we have the Cube Controller Manager. And the Cube Controller Manager is an aggregation of different controller processes which get compiled into one single binary. To control the processes within the Cube Controller Manager, take responsibilities within the cluster to control uh, certain events. They can be divided into the following. We have the node controller, and the node controller processes watch the health of the nodes within the cluster and respond if one or many nodes shut down. Next would be the job controller. And the job controller processes uh, watch so-called uh, job objects, which represent a single task within the cluster. If such an object is detected, the job controller creates pods to fulfill such a task and then terminates the pod uh, after fulfillment. And the third one is the uh, service account and token controller. And th this is for account management, creating default accounts and issues API access tokens for new namespaces. An important component is the ETCD. And the ETCD is a consistent and highly available key value store for persisting clusters data. So all the data of the cluster get persisted in the ETCD. Next, we have the cloud controller manager. The cloud controller manager is there to provide cloud specific control logic. It allows you to link your cluster to a cloud provider's API. And it makes sure that there is a clear cut between components which interact with a cloud platform and those which interact uh, directly with your cluster. So Cloud Controller Manager is like the job controller, a combination of different controllers. The node controller, responsible for checking a connected cloud provider and monitors the deletion and cleanup of these nodes on the cloud provider system. Then we have the route controller, establishing uh, routing for the underlying cloud infrastructure and the service controller, uh, which is there for managing the cloud provider's uh, load balancers. And then uh, a single node has its own components as well. So every node is responsible for running and managing pods as well as providing the Kubernetes runtime environment. So a node contains different components making this possible. And one is the kubelet. And the kubelet is using pod specs, pod specifications, which are provided to the kubelet. And the kubelet can run uh, your container images within a pod and ensure they are uh, healthy at all time. So a kubelet is a fixed part within every node on a Kubernetes cluster. Then the second one is the kube proxy. And the kube proxy is the default network proxy running in each node within your Kubernetes cluster. It follows the Kubernetes service concept, which describes the network exposure of a pod as a network service. So that means that the kube proxy is maintaining defined network rules on nodes and is uh, exposing your container images through pods within the nodes. Uh, we're coming now to the Kubernetes object model. So we've introduced so much new stuff. And before I talk about uh, SAP's own offering, I want to quickly talk about this Kubernetes object model. And Kubernetes has objects and these objects, uh, and we know some of them already, are persistent entities in each Kubernetes system. So Kubernetes uses these objects to represent the state of your cluster. Uh, so now a bell should ring, exactly our pods are a Kubernetes object. And pods are the smallest and simplest Kubernetes objects there is. Uh, they are a unit of deployment within the Kubernetes cluster and they run on a cluster node. So it represents a single instance of an application and they're a logical collection of one or more containers which are scheduled together on the same host uh, with the pod and share the same network namespace. This means they share a single IP address, which originally is assigned uh, to the pod. They also have access to the same mounted volumes, the storage. And pods themselves are ephemeral, which means that they are not self-healing, which is why they are used together with the uh, Kubernetes controllers who are responsible for handling the pod's replication fault tolerance and so give them self-healing capabilities. So by themselves, they don't have the self-healing capabilities. Other objects, for example, are the replica sets. And we've learned that they are responsible for scaling our application container images to the required numbers of replications. 
Uh, another big one is deployments, which provide declarative updates to pods and the replica sets. They are managed by the deployment controller, which is part of the master node, and ensures that the current state always matches the required state of a deployment. And deployments help allow for seamless application updates and rollbacks and manage replica sets as mentioned um, before to scale your applications. And one of the last major Kubernetes objects are namespaces. And they allow you to partition your cluster into virtual subclusters. So important to know is that resources and objects within a namespace are unique to the dedicated namespace itself. And Kubernetes creates four four default namespaces within uh, the creation or with the creation of the cluster. And I want to just introduce you to them. We have the cube system, which contains the objects created by the Kubernetes system. Then we have the default namespace, which is the default namespace you as an admin can work in. Then we have the cube public namespace, which is an unsecured and publicly readable uh, namespace to expose public information about your cluster. And of course, lastly, the cube node lease, holding lease objects associated with each node. And these node leases allow the cubelet to send uh, heartbeats, so the current status of the node. And that's all you gotta know for now. Whew, we've talked a lot about uh, Kubernetes and its architecture, and we've seen the different types of components and their responsibilities. Uh, we understood what features Kubernetes provides and how it can help us uh, manage our application container images. And I know this is a lot and can seem overwhelming at first, but don't give up uh, just yet or uh, let me discourage you in learning further. There's a ton of resources uh, out there helping you to get more detail and understand better what I've talked about. And one of them is the SAP Developers YouTube channel uh, within, uh, with the Cloud Native for Beginners series. And another resource, a great resource is, um, and I, I use that to understand it better, is the official Linux Foundation courses introducing Kubernetes and its architecture. Our last topic for today is SAP's offering, the SAP BTP Kima Runtime. And I want to quickly introduce you to the SAP BTP Kima Runtime. And most of you probably know of this offering already, um, but if you don't, so here you go. The, there are different types of Kubernetes offerings out there. They range from bare metal all the way to managed Kubernetes runtimes. And Kima is exactly that. It is a fully managed Kubernetes runtime. And what's interesting about this offering is that it is based on the open source project Kima. So you can check it out on the official website or on GitHub where you can even open pull requests to contribute to Kima. And Kima on BTP is there for you as SAP folks, uh, folks to extend SAP solutions with serverless functions or combine them with containerized microservices. So it brings all the benefits of Kubernetes to the table and gives you easy integration into the SAP ecosystem uh, through smooth consumption of SAP applications as well as non-SAP applications. It can run workloads in a highly scalable environment and build event and API based extensions, so it allows you to do that. So we will hear more about Kima in the upcoming sessions during Devtoberfest, so make sure to mark your calendars for that. And with that, I would really want to thank you for joining me on that quick tour through the history and definition of Cloud Native and Kubernetes. And I hope I uh, didn't overwhelm you with all that information. And uh, if you have questions or ideas or want to have something improved, just let me know in the comments uh, of this session or on my social media profiles uh, on GitHub or in the SAP community itself. And uh, really, really thank you for, for joining and watching uh, this session today and I see you soon. Thank you.